Uh, welcome back, uh, viewers. Uh, this is uh, program Roshni. You are watching on Hadai TV. Uh, I have with me Claire Bolvin from Deafblind UK. Uh, Nazreen, ye amare saath hain. Uh, Deafblind UK se Claire Bolvin aur ye bata rahi hain ki kono kono si services Deafblind jo log hain, jo uh, sunne aur dekhne mein jinko mushkilat hain, dushwariyan hain, wo kis tarah se kono kono si services in se aasir kar sakte hain. Uh, so, Mazid Guftu Hogi, to Abi um, Chalte, going back to Claire. Uh, about the, you mentioned about, uh, before, before I ask you the other question um, that I wanted to, but before something else came into my mind, uh, you, you said the deafblind, you are outreach officer in the Leeds and Bradford area. Are the other, uh, in other cities, do does the deafblind UK have outreach offices? officers in other cities yeah. that will provide sports uh, um, and as assist to uh, people with uh, deafness and blindness? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, We've yeah. got some very successful projects across the United Kingdom. We've got them based in London, Essex, Wales, Northern Ireland. We don't have an outreach officer in every area of the UK at the moment, mm -hmm. but we do have ambitious plans to expand our current outreach programme so that we want to cover other areas. It depends on funding as to whether we can provide that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we do have other outreach officers across the country. If there was somebody who wanted to access membership but isn't based in one of the areas that we have an outreach officer, I would recommend that they still sign up and I'd encourage them to become a member of Deafblind UK. And then if we do, because they still get access to our information and advice line, to mm -hmm. our open hand magazine. So they've still got lots of different areas they can get information and support from us. And then if we do have an outreach officer in their area, we'll let them know as soon as that happens. So you have a telephone advice line as well? Yeah, yeah, we've got a telephone number, yeah. So how do those people, uh, if someone is deaf, how do, we get, or do, how do they get in touch with, how do they communicate? Uh, on the phone when they cannot see someone uh, with the sign language or wh wh how do they communicate? Yeah, so I've got the caller on the line. Oh, okay. Uh, hello. Hello there. Uh, who's calling you from? Hello, my name is Rob. I'm calling from Halifax. Hi, Robert. Uh, what is your question? Uh, I, uh, I myself um, in, in later life have developed Deaf blindness mm. um, through an illness, and um, I'm getting or feeling increasingly isolated from my community and friends. Mm. And if I were to sign up to the service, um, how long roughly would I have to wait before I could meet some people to befriend me and things? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, Robert from Halifax. Yeah. Uh, did you hear him? Yeah, I think I got the, um, the question there. So thank you very much for your call, Rob. With regard to wanting to sign up to being a member, you can sign up to do that straight away. Mm -hmm. You can either do that by going on our website, which is www.deafblind.org.uk, or you can call our um, information and advice line on 0800 132 320, and you can sign up to be a member straight away. From that information and advice line, and um, call them once you've signed up to be a member what we can then do is match you up with the local outreach officer if you have one in the area and they will come to visit you and talk about matching you with the volunteer befriender the volunteer befriender process does take around eight weeks to complete and the reason for that is that we will do the assessment we'll find out what you'd like to do with that volunteer befriender what kind of activities you'd like to access particularly if you are feeling isolated at this moment in time, we will then go out and recruit a volunteer befriender for you. And that process requires doing the recruitment and the advertising, the interview, taking up references, doing a criminal record check, and providing that person with the training to make sure that they're absolutely right for you as, um, as your volunteer befriender. So the process does take around seven to eight weeks. But what we would do is make sure that you're kept well informed and you are um, throughout the whole process so that you know where we're up to and that we will match you as soon as we possibly can. Does that thank cover? Thank you, yes, thank you very much. I think uh, that is the, you've answered the question. I hope Robert um, uh, will uh, 
and be able to sign up uh, to become a member and then uh, get the relevant support, the services that he requires. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about that you recruit, when someone sign up for a membership, yeah. you recruit somebody and check up their criminal, criminal record and you, you have a process uh, you go through. Do they have, are they volunteers or are they have a paid member? They're volunteers, they're yeah. Volunteers. So they, yeah. So they give the time for free to be befriended. So, um, but we've got plenty of volunteers across the country mm. giving the time to be befriended to our deafblind members. So, um, but yeah, they are volunteers. Oh, right. Okay. That's, that's something I, you know, I want to ask: How a volunteer can can help deafblind people who are on the membership list? So do you mean how can people how sign can, up to be a volunteer? How can, yeah, how can people sign up to be a volunteer yeah. uh, to provide the uh, relevant help and support to uh, the people who are deaf or blind? Yeah, so we, we have lots of volunteers supporting us in lots of different ways. One of the key areas is, as we were just talking about, the befriending. So we can do befriending either online, which is by email. So rather than visiting someone face to face, you might have a conversation with them by email. We can also do that by telephone. So we mm. call that a telephone <coughs> befriender. So then you would have the same kind of conversation, but over the telephone. But then we also have social befrienders who will visit <coughs> people in the home and they will then support that person to access activities or their community, whatever it is that they want to do, then that befriender can support them with that. We also have volunteers who run support groups for us, so that's where we get groups of deafblind people together and volunteers will help us in terms of facilitating that and making sure that things like uh, coffees are bought and people are meeting and greeted and that everyone's getting full access to the group. So there's lots and lots of ways that people can volunteer mm. and we are very much looking for volunteers. <coughs> so if anybody was watching and is interested in being a volunteer, the best way to do that is to contact our head office on the details that I just gave, either the website or the telephone number <coughs> and ask about getting a volunteer application form and then we would just take it from there. Volunteer often uh, claim the expenses. Can they claim expenses uh, from the DeafBlind UK? In some circumstances, yes. It mm. depends on what the volunteer role is that they're doing. So if they're doing volunteer driving, so that's one area that I didn't mention, but sometimes a deafblind person mm. might want to go and access an activity or an event, but they can't actually get there because public transport isn't accessible to them for whatever reason that may be. So we have volunteer drivers who will pick that person up and take them to the destination that they want to get to. And then we would then pay for the mileage for, um, for that journey that the volunteer driver's making. So it depends on the volunteer role. It depends on what it is that they're doing. But yeah, we would discuss that with the volunteer at the application stage to make sure that they're fully happy and comfortable with the situation around expenses. In, in your earlier discussion, you mentioned about respite. How does respite help people? Um, because there are many people who doesn't know what is respite, how it is helpful to them. In respite, so do you mean for carers for or carers, for? For carers and, and uh, people with, well, mainly for carers. For carers, yes. Yeah. So, in terms of people who are caring for deafblind people, when mm. we talk about respite, it's about that, that, that time for the carer to have for themselves, but also for the deafblind person to have some independence away from the carer as well. That is something that we don't do as much these days mm. um, through Deafblind UK, but we do have two subsidiary organisations called About Me and I Decide, and they are social enterprises. So Deafblind UK are the charity, and I work for the charity, but we also have two, we can call them subsidiary or sister organisations, and they are social enterprises which support deafblind people or people <coughs> with single sensory loss or deafblind people with additional disabilities mm. around personal independence, around recruiting personal assistance to support them with day-to-day -day living and independent living. And we can support throughout the process of uh, a, 
recruiting for a person or assistant through the ongoing management of that person and through the ongoing support of that person. So we will support through those subsidiary organisations around that, around that res respite and perhaps support for carers as well. Uh, can you tell me about the, um, uh, what are the causes of deaf blindness? Yeah, so there's lots and lots of different causes of deaf blindness. Some people are born deaf blind. It could be genetic, it could be through the circumstances of the birth. They could contract an illness either before or after birth, which then leads to that person being deaf blind. Some people may have a condition um, such as cancer. The treatment for cancer can actually affect both sight and hearing, leaving that person with um, a combined sight and hearing loss. Uh, leading them to be deaf blind. There's a lot of deaf blind people who have a condition called Usher syndrome, which manifests in different ways in different people. But for some people, they may be born profoundly deaf mm -hmm. and then start to experience the sight loss in later life. Or for other people with Usher syndrome, they may be born with full hearing and full sight and then both start to deteriorate in later life. The majority of deaf blind people have acquired sight and hearing loss and that's through the ageing process so as they get older a lot of people start to experience the sight and the hearing loss and for that group of people they might not consider themselves deaf blind so they may not recognise the impact that their deaf blindness is having on the day to day life but we know that it does have a massive impact on, the, on their access to information on their ability to communicate with other people and also their ability to be mobile as well. So we speak to a lot of people around identifying that they've got a combined sight and hearing loss and then we can offer support and advice into how to manage that. Uh, um, can you tell me, I do understand that uh, people who are deaf, uh, they communicate with, with each other with the British Sign Language. Um, how does deaf blind people communicate with each other? Yeah, so deaf blind people, because of all the different ways in which people can become deaf blind the or... People cannot see. Uh, sign lang British Sign Language is that people can see um, the sign language and they can interpret and they can understand and uh, they communicate with each other. But people who are deaf and blind, how do they communicate? Yeah. That they cannot see the sign language? Yeah, so the people who are deafblind communicate in a, a wide variety of different ways. In terms of British Sign Language, because to be deafblind, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have complete sight loss and complete hearing loss. There are lots of deafblind people, particularly those who might have been born deaf and then later start to lose their sight, who will still use British Sign Language to communicate because they still have enough sight to be able to see the hand moving to then interpret and understand that information. Where you have a deafblind person who doesn't have enough sight to be able to see the hand, to understand the sign language, we call it hands-on British sign language. And what that is, is where the deafblind person links hands with the person who's, who's making the sign and through feeling the movement of the hand, they will then understand that information through holding on to the hands rather than actually seeing the hands. So that's one way the deafblind people might communicate through sign language. There's another couple of hands-on methods for communication. One might be through finger spelling, which is where you use British Sign Language, the letters in BSL but you actually put it onto the deafblind person's hand so they again will feel the movement of the fingers and through finger spelling the words will understand what it is that you're saying. Or you can actually write onto a deafblind person's hand. It's called block and that's where you put it onto the hand, the capital letters, and you write each word on. And that's another way that a deafblind person might communicate by using a hands-on form, hands form of language. You might be surprised to know though that actually most deafblind people use clear speech to communicate. So they will still use speech, they will still listen to speech and they will still use speech. But there might be some adaptations that you'd need to make, such as speaking a bit slower or speaking a bit louder. But that is again very dependent on the deafblind person and how they prefer to communicate. So if you are working with anybody who's deafblind or you meet someone who's deafblind, the first and best question to ask would be, 
what their preferred method of communication because they will be able to tell you what works best for them. Do you have members who are Muslim and deaf or deaf blind? Do we have Muslim Muslim people, uh, people who are Muslim? Yeah. yeah. Uh, are they? Uh, do do you have members that who are Muslims and they are deaf yeah. or deaf blind? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So to be a member of our organisation, you have to have a combined sight and hearing loss. So anybody who's a member will be uh, deaf. We would call them deaf blind. They were self-identified deaf blind. But our members come from all different communities, all different cultures. So we would. Yeah, absolutely. Some of our members may be Muslim. Yeah. They come from because deaf blindness is a is a human condition. It would be anybody in the UK with a combined sight and hearing loss from any different faith, any different culture, any different community. Everybody is welcome and encouraged and advised to be a member of our organisation if they have a combined sight and hearing loss. If a Muslim um, needs a help and help a help in a mosque. Uh, if someone is in the mosque and they want this person is deaf blind or deaf, how do you provide support to to those Muslim in in the mosque? It would absolutely depend on what the support is that they need because every member is an individual. We would ask them what the support is that they need mm -hmm. if they so first of all, it'd be what support do they need with regard to their combined sight and hearing loss. So if they need support with access to communication, or it might be that they need to be guided into the mosque and um, if they're registered blind, it really depends on what support they need. We will first find that out. But then if there's a reasonable adaptation needed in regard to them entering the mosque, whatever that reasonable adaptation might be, we will, um, we will consider that with the member, speak to them about it and make reasonable adjustments to suit that individual person. So it really, it really depends on, on the member, what it is that they want, and we will, we will communicate with each individual and really take it from there. Can you tell me more about your outreach work? Um, because uh, there, you did mention um, some of your work. Um, can you tell me more, uh, because uh, you work in Bradford and Leeds area, and you are approachable to people who live in this area, um, if you tell us a bit more about the uh, work and uh, so people can uh, approach you and uh, either become members or you can visit their, their homes and offer them uh, some of this support that they may require. Yeah, yeah. So the outreach project is very much about tackling isolation and about encouraging and empowering access to local communities. Yeah, there's not been mentioned so. about is isolation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. It really that's the that's the key focus of the project because we know that many deafblind people in the UK don't have any contact with people from one week to the next. So what we're trying to do is to reach those people and to make links and really remove barriers to any um, access to the community. So my job's about reaching those people. So it's about making sure that they're actually aware that we're here, to make them aware that I'm here to support them as an outreach officer. And then once they are aware of the charity and of the service that we can offer, like you said, I can go and visit them in the home yeah. and I can tell them about what's available in the local community because it might be that we have a deafblind person who wants to go and be part of a community gardening project but doesn't feel that they have the correct adaptations or that they will be able to communicate when they get there or there might be a barrier in terms of them actually getting to that community gardening project. So it's about going out to them, working out what it is that they want to do and then putting some measures into place to enable them to access the activities that they want to do. So if it was the community gardening project, I might do some deaf blindness awareness training with the leader of the gardening project and its members. We might put a volunteer befriender in place or a volunteer driver to get that person to the community gardening project. And then we might offer them a social befriender so that when they get there, if it is that they aren't confident in communicating initially with people that they've not met before, mm. then we might break down some of those barriers. Then once they're integrated in the group and they feel happy and comfortable and confident going, then we would have supported them to build some of those links. So the, the job really is about, I keep saying it, but it's about every individual because not every, mm. 
not one person is the same and not every deaf blind person is the same. So it's really about working with them, doing the outreach with them and making it a very individually focused service so that they get from it what it is that they need and want. Uh, you mentioned that people meet as well. Um, you also offer uh, a chance to meet with other deaf people or deaf blind people. Um, when they meet with each other, uh, what are the main activities they're involved in? Okay, so at the moment, across the UK, we have lots and lots of deafblind UK groups who meet and get together and they do, it could be as simple as having a coffee morning yeah. or they might want to do an activity like crafts or cooking or going for a walk in the local area. In Bradford and Leeds at the moment, we don't actually run any groups and the reason for that is because the project is very new to the area. So I've only been in the job about two months now. So what I'm doing is going and t speaking to all of our members, trying to work out what it is that they actually want. And then where there is a need for deafblind people to meet other deafblind people, then we will then look at that in a local area and look at setting it up. So that would mean perhaps looking at community centres, mm. trying to find a room that would be convenient and suit people, and then looking at transport for the deafblind people to get to the group. But like I say, at the moment, we don't run any groups in the area at this point in time because the project is very new to the area. But elsewhere in the country, we it really depends on what people want to do, but people do. They might go on a trip <laughs> to the seaside. It, could, it really could be absolutely anything, but that's very much done in collaboration with the members of the group to find out and identify what they want to do. So what, what sort of most deafblind people, what are the things that they mostly like to do? Uh, well, it is. It's, I can't really answer that question, could they? Because cause every deafblind person is different. <laughs> I couldn't say that the majority of <laughs> deafblind people like to do one particular thing. I think from the members I've spoke to in this area, many of them aren't in contact with other deafblind people. So they those shared experiences of living with, com um, with combined sight and hearing loss, at the moment they don't have anybody to talk to about. So I think at the minute I'm seeing that there's a real need for deafblind people just to be in contact with other deafblind people to say and talk about the different challenges that they've got and maybe work together about overcoming those challenges and really just giving each other advice and support. So I think at the moment one of the key areas that I'm going to be focusing on over the next couple of months is how we can put people into contact with each other just so that they can share the experiences and then they can support each other and hopefully empower and build confidence in each other to, you know, ju ju just to really mm. share those experiences. Uh, do they, um, f I've got a caller on the line. Hello. Hello, Salam alaikum. Well, Salam alaikum. Where are you from? Yes, I'm from Pakistan. I'm from Pakistan. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. What do you say? Yes, yes. 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 Yes, Probably don't. Up uh, on air, hey, bad car, sakte hai. Right, it was from Pakistan, and uh, don't know why he couldn't communicate. Um, he wanted to ask something, but he couldn't. Uh, okay, if if some deafblind uh, people plan their holidays abroad, um, if they need some sort of um, help and support. Do you have vol volunteers who could um, assist, them, assist them on their holidays? We wouldn't have volunteers who could assist them in going on holiday. It would be, we could certainly, through our volunteering programme, support people in researching flights, in researching accommodation, in letting people, the people who 
run the hotel now that a deafblind person need come in and looking at reasonable adjustments that they might need. <clears throat> so that might be putting them on a ground floor apartment, for example, in terms of looking at the transport from the airport. In terms of actually assisting and going on that holiday, the only area we could support with something like that would be through one of our subsidiary organisations, which would be in terms of booking a personal assistant. <coughs> with regard to booking a personal assistant, that would be a paid service through that, and it would depend on the individual, the deafblind person. Sometimes they might have a budget which enabled them to pay for a PA to accompany them on holiday, but it would depend on the individual. They might have the means to fund that themselves, but that would be something we'd look at through our social enterprises rather than our charity, which is more focused on that empowering, that support. We can't really accompany people in terms of, of going on a holiday, even if it's a, a hospital appointment or a dentist appointment. While we can support in terms of transport and travelling to that area, we couldn't actually go into the hospital appointment with the person. It's about empowering them rather than us being able to go with them. We have to conclude the programme uh, um, uh, at the end. Uh, do you have anything, uh, we've got 30 seconds, any message yet that you would like to um, share? Yep, so really if you want to get in touch with Deafblind UK, please just visit our website www.deafblind.org.uk or give us a call on our information and advice line on 0800 132 320. If you just give us a call or visit our website then we'll be able to help with any of the issues that we've discussed today. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much Claire for being on the, on to the show. Thank you so much. I hope that many people will benefit from your talk today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Today's program, because the time is over, we can't answer all the questions. We hope that you have received the information. It is certainly will be beneficial for you, and you will have a lot of benefit from it. So, inshallah, we will meet you in the next program. If you have seen the program, because it is the Dementia Week. Next week, Dementia Week, which people forget. That's why it will be a Dementia Week program. Please watch it. تب تک مجھے اجازت دیجئے میرے طرف سے اللہ حافظ